Good evening, and welcome to the Bangalore International Center for our program this evening, Why Lal Bagh Matters, Sultan's Garden to Public Park. It is a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, Vijay Thiruvadi, and our discussant, Arun Pai. Welcome. Um, among the accounts of our city, Vijay Thiruvadi's recent book, published by the Bangalore Environment Trust, presents the most comprehensive history of Lal Bagh written to date. Ranging across five centuries, it gives us an appreciation of what a wondrous place Lal Bagh is. The book is based on documentation from Kew Gardens, the British Library, uh, the India Office Records, uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh, and of course on Vijay's intimate knowledge of Lal Bagh, having conducted nature walks for over 15 years that have been attended by over 15,000 walkers. Uh, he said it's probably more than that, but you can say 15,000. Um, uh, many of you here, I'm sure, have been on them. And uh, speaking for myself, I can say that his walks under the green canopy of Lal Bagh have been a, a real source of solace and inspiration. This book joins his other notable books, one on the heritage trees of Bangalore, and one on Devrakadus and Gundutopus in and around Bangalore. He has spoken at BIC earlier on the trees of Bangalore with Girish Karnad and Captain Prabhala, and on botanical illustrations with Nirupa Rao. And we are very pleased to have him back. Our discussant, Arun Pai, is the founder of Bangalore Walks, which has conducted city walks on weekends for the past 15 years. Arun is a Bangalore lover and enjoys its stories and history. In 2005, he says he took a few people for a walk on MG Road and told them the city's story. And he's been doing it as a profession ever since. Vijay's lecture will be followed with it by a discussion with Arun, and they will then take questions from the audience. I should mention that this evening's event is in association with the Bangalore Literature Festival, which is being held at BIC this year on December 18th and 19th. Uh, today's lecture is the first of what we are calling uh, our open mic series, Raising the Curtain on the Festival. And uh, without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Vijay Thirubadi. Thank you, Pratiti. Uh, my book on Lal Bagh was written just about a year ago, hurriedly, and because of the pandemic, we've not had a chance to give a presentation on it or talk about it. So I'm very, very grateful to BIC for giving me this opportunity. And I'm also overwhelmed with the number of people who've come here. Thank you. Now, I'm going to talk about many aspects of Lal Bagh, which are generally not known. I'm not going to list out all the achievements of all the superintendents and people who helped Lal Bagh. But what I think are the key things uh, will be presented anyway. There are time limitations, so I can't discuss everything. There is a great, great history to Lal Bagh. Most of it is not known to the public. We generally hear about and read almost every week in some paper or the other or journal about the last four superintendents of Lal Bagh starting after 1870. But there's much, much more about Lal Bagh, which I wish to talk about. Uh, the book is called Sultan's Garden to Public Park. That is where the activity was concentrated in Lal Bagh. But before that, much before that, Kempe Gowda built his tower in Lal Bagh on the rock. And by the side, uh, he had a little flower garden to provide flowers to the people, you know, to the temples in his domain. This was continued. This was 1537. This was continued by his son, Magdi uh, Kempegoda, right up to uh, 1559. Then we don't have records of what happened since, but they must have continued with the flower garden, Huvina Topa. And we know that when the Wadayars took that area over in the 1730s, 
they were, uh, you know, the Lalbagh and the area around right up to the fort uh, were given as a jagir to Hyder Ali because he drove the Marathas out of Karnataka, out of Mysore then. And uh, the Marathas had been raiding uh, Mysore regularly and collecting tributes. They even partially destroyed Sringeri Temple. So Hyder Ali mounted an attack on the uh, Maratha camps every night for three months and drove them out of Mysore. In recognition of that, the Wadayars gave him a Jagir from Bangalore Fort, the Pater included, and uh, what is now Lalbagh, this whole area. So Hyder Ali started a garden in present-day Lalbagh, which is almost exactly the same area uh, where Kempe Gauda had his flower garden. Hyder Ali's garden was uh, based on the Charbagh Muslim Persian style gardens, and he got his plants from the four, four other famous gardens in India at that time, Lahore and Multan, Delhi and Akat. Akat had a beautiful Charbagh. Now I go, go back to the earliest part of what we call Lalbagh today. To start with, Lalbagh is very, very special in many ways. Today we talk about the little Walden area, uh, which is a public park and a botanic garden. But we can go right back to, to Gondwana land, which broke up into four or five pieces. And one of them was the Indian tectonic plate, which moved northwards and finally collided with the Eurasian continent. There it is, collided with the Eurasian continent created the Tibetan Islands and the Himalayas and the great river valley systems, the Indus, Brahmaputra and the Ganges were formed after that. Down in the peninsula, halfway between uh, both Mangalore and Madras, present day Madras, uh, right in the center of the plateau at 3000 feet, Bangalore city was formed. Now, the, the, Formation of the, uh, you know, of the peninsula and the rock which uh, just south in Lalbagh is quite, quite spectacular. As the geologist, there was a Captain Newbold who was in the army and he was also a great orientalist in the 1800s. He made a large number of trips in peninsula India and studied the geology and the mineralogy of the whole area. He talks about Netherworld rocks from the center of the earth, hypogene and trappian rocks, all of them under great pressure and temperature, all of them molten and all of them going towards the surface of the earth. Before they hit the surface of the earth, they mix with the molten magma, finally break through and then raft onto the lithosphere of the earth and then stabilized three billion years ago, three billion years ago. 3,000 million years ago. And the Lalbagh rock, as we see today, is an outcrop of th that, you know, prodigious outburst, as Newbold mentions. Now, uh, this, this rock is something which geologists from all over the world come to, to study even today. Because it was originally called, uh, it was called granitic gneiss, even before that by Robert Bruce Foote, who, who was at the uh, Mysore Geological uh, Department, he called it Peninsula Gneiss. The last name which remains is Gneiss Complex. And the, it signifies a material which has undergone plutonic, vol volcanic, and sedimentary cycles, all telescoped into each other more than once, leading to deformation and metamorphism. And that is what we see in Lalbagh today. It's the uh, finest place in the world to study the formation of the earth. As I said, this is 3 billion years old and the earth's age is 4 or 4.5 billion years old. So it's three quarters of the age of the earth, the rock you see in Lalbagh. We had a, a person who had come from Cape Town Observatory. He said, don't forget to mention it's one, roughly one quarter of the age of the universe, which was 12.5 billion years ago, 
the Big Bang. So we have a tremendous geological heritage here in Bangalore in the Lalbagh rock, which we don't realize and we don't bother about. We trample over it. Over it. Anyway, that is our geological heritage. Now, Lalbagh has three things. One is the rock, going back to 3,000 million years ago. Then there were megalithic burial chambers just found next to the rock. Now, this, this megalithic burial chamber, chamber, right within present-day Walden Lalbagh, goes back to 1.8 to about 3,000 years ago. Uh, and the, for some reason, and it has to be a stupid reason, the artifacts inside were taken out, potsherds and urns, and put in the government museum. They're no longer there. We don't know where it is. Then they actually flattened the site out, just next to the rock. Uh, I don't know why they did that. But anyway, it's no longer there. But early Iron Age man lived right within Lalbagh. Then after that, uh, we know Lalbagh actually, the Lalbagh I talk about is any area, any place within 10 kilometers radius of the rock. Now, at the uh, defense airport in 1965, and they were expanding the aprons for larger aircraft to taxi in, they found hordes of Augustus Caesar and Tiberius's coins, which is extraordinary because it means that Lalbagh was probably a uh, passage between the east and west coast of India for trade. We know from Sir Mortimer Wheeler's excavations at Arikamedu, just three miles from Pondicherry, that the Yavanas, who were the bodyguards of the Tamil kings, lived there, and these coins were found there. He went into the quarters of the Yavanas. He also found uh, Arezzo ware, which are clay jars, which were, which are filled with wine and brought all the way from Arezzo right into uh, Pondicherry, Arikamedu, which means the Tamil kings lived very well because the Yavanas were the bodyguards of the Tamil kings and they were Romans. And these coins were found just seven kilometers as the crow flies in uh, Bangalore and some have been found on the west coast. So I suspect that this uh, Bangalore and Lalbagh would have been uh, literally a passage for trade from the east to the west coast at that time, 50 years before Christ and 50 years after Christ. Now these coins would not have been used as currency. No king would permit the currency of another uh, ruler to, uh, you know, to be used in, in his kingdom. But they were so accurate, they were probably used as accurate measures for trade. Now, I've talked about these three things, the rock, the megalithic burial chambers and the coins, which shows you the antiquity of Bangalore as well as Lalbagh itself. I haven't got anywhere near talking about the artifacts, the botany and the rest. This is surely the, one of the most spectacular sites in the world, S-I-T-E-S. Now, the people who lived in Lalbagh, it would seem up to about 1600, were Jains and Hindus. They left behind artifacts, which we can see till, till today in Lalbagh itself. On the left, you have what is called a Veerakallu. That is commemorative stones, generally, you know, three or four inches thick were mined or uh, they were quarried from a nearby rock. And bar relief sculptures are made of the hero. Right? Commemorative stones actually commemorating the valor of the hero whether he outlived the battle or not. In this particular case in Lalbagh, we have this next to the rock, a rock again, this wonderful bas-relief sculpture, which shows a warrior wielding a spear, which is obviously his preferred weapon of war. And on the left, you have two women celebrating with percussion instruments, which means that he outlived the battle. And these bas-relief sculptures are done with great subtlety. It seems quite rough as it is, but look at the way the spear is portrayed there. It is slightly bent, which gives it motion. It's as though it's about to leave his hand. So that I didn't know uh, how to date it, because right there, prominent, 
but I didn't have any dates. There's nothing on this bar relief sculpture. So I, uh, there's a gentleman from the Indian Institute of Historical Study who said, uh, 1400 AD. So I said, how did he arrive at the magical date? He said, look at the headdress of the warrior and the hairstyle of the ladies who've got their hair piled up on the side. The, these were the prevalent styles during the Vijayanagar Empire. 1365 onwards, I think. And so he said, happily say 1400, nobody can contest it. So there you are, we say that in 1400, this, this sculpture was put up. Uh, you have another one or two of these in Lalbagh within the Walden compound even today. The other ones near the joint director's office. It's a beautiful sculpture showing a dead hero being assisted on his way by Apsaras to his heavenly kingdom, kingdom Kailasa. Now on the right you have a Nishidi stone. The, many of them have been found around Lalbagh. Uh, this one is from near Begur, seven kilometers from Lalbagh. Nishidi stones are uh, stones which are uh, actually, again, bar relief sculptures, again, three or four inch slabs. They're done by Jains. Jains uh, fasted as often as they could. They were a pretty peaceful lot, and they spent a lot of their time in meditation and spiritual practices. And often, when they felt that they'd learned enough and developed enough spiritually in the world into which they were born, they calmly fasted to death. And at that point, they achieved nirvana, or mukti, or moksha, or spiritual liberation, and wanted to get on with their practices into the next world. At the spot where the uh, Jane died, they had these very ornate, beautiful bar-relief sculptures called Nishidi stones. So that's a Nishidi stone there on the right, but this is not half as ornate as uh, most of them. So these were the two communities who lived there. The Muslims came in afterwards. Uh, it was uh, uh, the Bahmani kingdoms controlled uh, Lalbagh, the Bijapur sultans, then the Mughals were there also for three years. They'd come in from Sira, where Dilava Khan was, uh, you know, Nawab Dilava Khan, he was there. Right. Now, after this, we get on to Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan. Haider is considered the real founder of Lalbagh. He was given this area, as I mentioned earlier, as a Jagir. Now, he struggled with the aridity of the land. And anyway, he set up three gardens. In 1759 or so, he fought the British and he was Forjdar of the Maharaja of Mysore's army at Dindigal. And within a year, uh, he controlled a territory which is twice the size of present-day Karnataka. Being a Muslim, to Muslims, a garden on earth is a reflection of, is a, of paradise. So the design of a garden was very important and the whole approach to the design was one of uh, almost you know, a, a sacred act. And Haider Ali as an act of piety and thanksgiving as a Muslim to thank his maker, set up three gardens. One in present day Lalbag in the territory given to him by the warriors. Another one at Malawali, which is halfway through from Bangalore to, uh, to Talakadu, which was the capital of the Western Ganga Kings. And the third one was at Sri Rangapatna itself. Now Haider died uh, in 1782 when his son Tipu Sultan took over. Tipu Sultan was an extraordinary man. He brought in plants from wherever in the world he'd heard of these plants, but particularly from French and Muslim territories, which he had uh, great access to. So he got plants from East Africa, Madagascar, Mauritius, Persia, Turkey, Tenerife, Canary Islands, and oaks and pines. And we're talking about 1782 uh, uh, around then. Oaks and pines from Cape Town, which was a great clearing house for plants worldwide. Tipu also got eucalyptus trees from Australia, which were planted in a summer palace in Nandi Hills. Now, this was an extraordinary thing because 
Australia itself as a country was formed in 1788. By 1793, Tipu had these eucalyptus trees in his summer palace. It's not clear how he got them, but Australia is the only place where you get eucalyptus trees from, except one species which is also available in the Philippines. And I don't know whom Tipu heard about this, but he wanted it in India and he got it. He may have got it from Pamplemousse Gardens, which is a great French botanic garden in Mauritius. Or he may have got it from a shipwreck of a Frenchman called uh, uh, Labinier, who was carrying eucalyptus trees from Australia westwards. Either way, he got them and it shows you the love he had for plants. They were not mere curiosities. He put them to work. He had a good feel for what would work uh, in the terrain of Bangalore. For example, he got what we call Chakota today, which is uh, Shadok or Pomelo, which is itself a cross, a hybrid of two citrus fruits, which were growing in China and Thailand at that time. He had a sure feel for what would work. He brought the Shadok, planted it outside Devanali Fort where he was born, and 200 years afterwards, we've got, he's got geographical indication tag for the Chakota. That means you can't call any Shadok or Pomelo Chakota unless it's been grown on the slopes of Chekbalapur. Just like cognac and champagne, if the grapes are grown in that region of France, then you can call them the brandy or champagne as being, you know, from Cognac or, or, or use the appellation Cognac. And he did, I mean, it was with everything that he did connected with plants seemed to work. He got silkworms from an island called Kesim, just off the coast of Oman. He got mulberry bushes from China through Bengal. He put them two together and created the greatest agro industry Karnataka has known, Mysore and Karnataka. He had over 350 centers for silk production. You can imagine the, you know, uh, the great things he did with plants. It was not just merely that he grew poppies on the slopes of uh, coming down from Nandi Hills uh, towards Devanali and earned regular revenue from the opium which was sold. Then there are so many other things which Tipu did connected with plants like an extraordinary use of plants was a uh, creeper which has formidable thorns called Cesepilinia uh, separia. And he used them, uh, you know, on, grew them all along his forts on the walls. And so if an enemy had crossed the moat, he still had to cross this, which was almost impossible to do. And so, so it go on, goes on, it's endless. And when I talked about eucalyptus, it was not just a stray thing, almost everything uh, Tipu touched turned into so many other things later in the subsequent years. Today, that those same eucalyptus trees are used for, eucalyptus pulp is used for new sprint. It is also used for making eucalyptus pulp first, then rayon grade pulp, and then it's converted into rayon cords for tires, which is done in Harrier polyfibers in Karnataka. And he's hardly been acknowledged. I mean, he did more in a sense than the botanists at that time did. At that time that Tipu was there, there were three great plant, plant collecting expeditions mounted out of London one by the Royal Society, one by the Royal Horticulture Society, and one by 12 of Linnaeus' students called the Apostles. They went everywhere in the world and they collected plants often at the cost of their own lives and funneled all these plants into Kew Gardens just outside London. When Tipu died, the British kept Lalbagh to themselves and all the plants in Kew Gardens was available for being planted in Lalbagh and any other place in India. So that was the kind of change after Tipu which took place. And Lord Robert Clive's son, Edward Clive, uh, who was governor of Madras from 1898 to 1904, or rather 
1798 to 1804, he recommended to Benjamin Hain, who was a German missionary at Tarangabadu, uh, Trankoba on the east coast of India, to appropriate Lalbagh Gardens. Now, Haynes has a botanical pedigree to him. Uh, one of Linnaeus's students called Koenig, he was a private student of Linnaeus, he had found his way to Trankoba. Trankoba was a Danish Norwegian territory which they happily gave up to the British because they couldn't find much use for it. Uh, this is an image of photograph of Dansborg, a formidable fort on the seaside, uh, which was built by the Danes. And Trankoba grew around the fort. Now, the, the Lutheran mission and the Hall mission from out of Germany, they settled down in Trankoba and they were basically missionaries there. They picked up the language of the local people, studied the religion, the caste systems, the palm leaf manuscripts which talked about the herbs growing in that region. And all of them in their spare time, uh, strangely enough, uh, they were interested in plants and started collecting all the plants around Trankoba. They formed a society called the United Brotherhood. And they got all these plants together. They didn't know enough about botany, but they sent them all off to Europe to start herbariums and to have them all fully identified. So you had uh, Koenig, who was a student of Linnaeus, coming to Trankoba. Koenig was a very, very bright person, and he was not satisfied with the little work he did around Trankoba. He joined the Nawab of Arkut and very soon joined the East India Company. And he started, he actually trained William Locksburg, who, who's called the, often called the father of Indian botany, who passed on everything he knew of modern botany, which Koenig had picked up from Linnaeus, and passed it all on to Benjamin Hain, who took over the Samal Court Gardens from Roxburgh in 1775, when Roxburgh went to Calcutta as the head of the Royal Botanic Gardens. Now, Benjamin Hain was an extraordinary man. He spent a little while uh, in Trankoba, wanted to go back to Germany, didn't find it conducive. And he was, there were, there were a whole lot of other very well-known botanists in the United Brotherhood and uh, Trankoba wanted to save him to do botanical work in India. So he was asked to take over Samal Court Gardens. He left Samal Court Gardens in 1799 when the British decided to close it down because it's just about 14 miles from present day Kakinada, the Samal Court, uh, because they found it was very similar to in climate to Royal Botanic Gardens in Calcutta. And it was repetitive work which was being done. It was a hot and humid climate. So they sent him to Bangalore, where he was part of McKinsey's root survey in 1800. He held, you know, put up, he had two hats, one for the uh, survey, and then he was asked to uh, actually appropriate Lalba Garden. Now, Haynes is one of the extraordinary men who, he was the first uh, European superintendent of Lalbagh, came in in 1800, took over Lalbagh properly in 1802, left in 1807 before his full tenure, which went up to 1812. Now, Hain introduced modern botany and definitely modern taxonomy straight into Lalbagh among the first places in India. And he did a hundred other things. He wrote a book on the 394 plants on the Coromandel Coast, uh, and a host of other things. Uh, perhaps we'll talk about him a little later. But he was asked to grow uh, potatoes and succulent vegetables in Lalbag for the European palate, European soldier's palate, if you please. So he grew the potato. He got the original stock from St. Helena, west of Africa, and he grew it on the slopes of Nandi Hill and Savanadur. These were the first potato plantations in India. He did this effortlessly. And when he went to check on the growth of the potato plantation in Savanadur, to his astonishment, he writes, 
that the natives had eaten it all up before I could see what had happened there. And he goes on to mention that the natives were very clever commercially, that they took the potatoes from both these plantations and they themselves marketed it across India to all the Englishmen who wanted it. This was the first potato plantation in India, but you can see what is generated out of Lal Bagh. Most people are not aware that what Haynes started in 1800 has led to India becoming the second largest potato uh, you know, producer in the world today. The second potato plantation was at Lander, where Ruskin Bond stays uh, in 1828, that is uphill from Missouri. So there are many, many things which Hain did out of Lal Bagh. Like he was a hands-on man, refused to sit behind a desk in Lal Bagh. He went to Coimbatore and uh, the Western Guards collected over three, 300 plants never seen by anybody else uh, or, or people outside the region where they grew. And he passed 200 of the plants still have the name which he gave them. Taxonomy, as you know, is half of botany. Anyway, he, pl he, sent, he planned to send all these plants to Dr. Wildeno, who was uh, uh, Alexander von Humboldt's botanical mentor. In the event, Wildeno died. Hain sent it to another friend called uh, Dr. Roth in Germany, who wrote one of the first floras of India based on the specimens that Hain sent out of Lal Bagh to Germany. Now, these are the things I'm talk, you know, emphasizing. That's the cover page of Dr. Roth's book. You can see Benjamin Haynes, na his name very clearly, Benjamin Hain, based on the specimens of Benjamin Hain. So, uh, these, he did so many more things, maybe we can talk about a little later. So, that was Benjamin Hain. A very restless, brilliant Teuton who did things very, very thoroughly. And the mark still remains through the books. He wrote a classic book called Tractus. Anyway, I'll move on. Uh, the next person was when Hain left, there was nobody to look after Lal Bagh. And uh, the British government then decided that Lal Bagh was not important. Bangalore was not important. They were going to set up a botanical garden in F Saranpur, which was called Farhat Baksh Garden, set up by a royal chief. They thought that was a better place for a botanical garden, which of course was not mentioned to anybody in Bangalore. So they, was, they suggested that the garden be looked after by anybody who has some knowledge of botany and of plants, and he could sustain it by selling the produce. So we had an uh, army paced paymaster called Gilbert Waugh coming in from Masuli Patnam. He got married to Charlotte Wahab in Masuli Patnam in 1807, came straight to Lal Bagh, and he was there in Lal Bagh for 11 years. We don't have too many details about what he contributed. We know that he brought in a lot of fruiting trees from China and from Europe, and he had some knowledge previously of growing sugar cane and coffee in the Mysore region. And then he was transferred in 1819 to Walalabad, and then he was straight on to Korg, and he was involved in the annexation of Korg. But I think his greatest contribution, not to Lal Bagh, but to India itself, was his son, Andrew Scott Waugh, who was the third surveyor general of India after uh, Everest. Lambton was the first one who was in Bangalore for some time. Then you had Everest, and it was it was actually Andrew Scott War with together with Sigdor, who together uh, declared Mount Fifteen as the tallest mountain in the world, which is now and they named it after Everest, who had never seen the mountain. But this is all part of the Great Trigonometrical Survey of India. General William Munro, I consider him the greatest, one of the greatest. He with Clegon who went Bangalore in the early years. He came to Bangalore at the age of 22, or maybe a little earlier. He was an army man, had no training in botany. He spent only four years in Lal Bagh. 
he started the Agro Horticulture Society, which was actually affiliated to the same society started by William Carey in Calcutta. And Munro was the secretary. Munro first went out to Coorg and Nilgiris and recorded the plants there through botanical illustrations. He discovered two new species of roses in Coorg, which have never been found since. He wrote the first flora of Bangalore, Hortus bangalorensis, when he was uh, in Bangalore. And that the original volume is in Kew Gardens. And it must be, you know, you must know this, that for over a hundred years after that, nobody has written about the flora of Bangalore. And William Munro did it effortlessly. Higginbotham's published a volume in uh, 1908, but I couldn't find a copy. I would have loved to see that copy of Munro's Flora Bangaloreensis, as he called it. Then he did many, many other things. He discovered at Kamti in North Karnataka, uh, a fossil of Gl Glossopteris. Now, Glossopteris is one of the fossils. It's referred to as a Permian seed uh, fern, which is one of the proofs of the theory of continental drift. Almost everything Munro seemed to do was of very great importance. He started a study of grasses and grasses and graminae, which includes bamboos, in Bangalore. And very soon, he became the world's greatest authorities on grasses and also on bamboos. Lots of plants have been named after him. He went to Agra from here uh, through North Karnataka and he started the Agra Botanical Gardens. And well, I'll get on to the next thing. Lots of plants, one of them is mentioned here. Munronia pinata. We'll probably, if we have time, talk about Munro. But he was just here for four years and he did earth-shaking things in terms of the impact on the west of the work he had done in Lalbag. You know, it wasn't a one-way traffic. Right. Dr. Clegon, he's my hero. He's hardly heard of in Bangalore today. He spent 20 years in India. He came into Bangalore after spending three years in Madras, uh, where he was a surgeon trained in St. Andrews and in, uh, in, in um, Edinburgh. Now he's an extraordinary man, he's called the Madras Polymath. Uh, he did innumerable things and all of them uh, which are still to be admired, definitive works. He was planted, I mean he was posted in Shimoga in 1845. And his job in Shimoga was to, he was considered the chief vaccinator, which makes some is of interest considering we're talking about vaccination uh, in India today with the pandemic. He was the chief vaccinator operating out of uh, Shimoga. He was also in charge of the hospital. He was in charge, he was the magistrate there and every morning he'd go to the jail. But in his spare time, note down, in his spare time, he did trips out of Shimoga into the Malnad and Maidan regions. He got hold of a Maratha artist whose name was not revealed and he made 450 drawings which have recently been discovered in the Royal Botanic Gardens. Edinburgh, I'll talk about that when we get to the section on botanical gardens. But he did many, many other things. This shows a map of Shimoga right in the center and the trips which Dr. Clegon took. Now Clegon didn't even mentioned that he had made these trips. From the annotations on each one of the drawings, uh, Mr. Nolte of Royal Botanic Gardens was able to make out the date of the visit and the place where, which he had visited. And put, put together, they, he ma managed to make this map out of his journeys out of Shimoga, which was all unofficial activity. And this artist he got hold of uh, whose name is not revealed. Uh, he was uh, of the Gudigar class. They are traditionally from Surab and uh, uh, in that area, uh, Bidanur, where they were sandalwood carvers and often painted in temples also. This Maratha's artist made 450 uh, brilliant, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, drawings of botanical illustrations, which will, which will, uh, which I'll show you later. But uh, this is the kind of work done by Clegon and his family donated 3,000 drawings to the Royal Botanic Garden, which were not seen till 10, 15 years ago. You know, and I got the first books and I'm in correspondence with Dr. Nolte to find out all this and very kindly let me, uh, gave me all this material. Yes, now Clegon was also represented India at the great, uh, you know, the, uh, the great international exhibition held at Hyde Park in 1851. And there, the, how, how, you know, the building which housed the great international exhibition was the Crystal Palace. Now, when Clegon had attended that, it was a huge section given for India and the produ raw produce, the manufactures, the paintings, uh, hundreds of things were exhibited in the Indian section, including the Kohinoor diamond. Uh, in the, now the inter great international exhibition was a defining point uh, in the 18th century, in 1851, because I, there were six million visitors. At that time, that's a lot of visitors in England within a six month period. And Clegon enjoyed being there, but it had a tremendous impact on him and on India. Uh, in fact, the impact on uh, Sir Jamshed J.G. Boy was such that he started based on what what was seen in the uh, exhibition, he started what is called the Bombay School of Arts and Industry, which later became the JJ School of Arts, among which there's some students here. And the first head of the JJ School of Arts was, of Arts was Rudyard Kipling's father, Lockwood Hart, uh, Kipling. And the, the, the JJ School of Arts started by him has molded, you know, Indian art for decades afterwards. But the Crystal Palace, is of importance to us in Lalbag because that was the model on which the Lalbag glass house was made. You know, it's a miniature of the Crystal Palace, which is three stories high, uh, completely a structure made out of glass and all of the weight of glass transmitted through hollow, narrow, slender columns to the ground. Now, Clegon was so inspired by what he saw at the exhibition, he came back to Madras and held two exhibitions. They were very, very famous in that time, in 1855 and 1857. I talk about all this because that was Madras presidency head that included all of Mysore, right from the West Coast to Orissa actually. Uh, and these exhibitions, they were so important and uh, Lord Harris was uh, the governor then. He thought it was so important that they actually declared a holiday uh, on the day of the exhibition to let the citizens know, they fired six cannons, uh, you know, from the battery at St. George, Fort St. George in Madras. That's the picture you see, the firing of the cannons, announcing this exhibition, which was a very, very great success of all the produce uh, in South India. And Clegon exhibited 28 different resins, uh, 45 different kinds of woods, uh, different dyes from plants and resins, a whole lot of things, including botanical illustrations. And this is all generated by Clegon, who was two years directly in charge of Lalbag. And he moved in and out, and he was later made the first conservator of forests in India in 1857. Yes. Now, when Clegon came in, already after four years, you had uh, Colonel Munro moving moving out in 1840. 1842, the Agri Horticulture Society wound up. Clegon came in in 1856, and there was nothing there in Lalbagh. Everything Munro had grown had practically disappeared. So Clegon felt uh, this is not the way to go about things. He wanted professionalism in Lalbagh, so he talked to. Sir William Hooker in Kew Gardens, and they decided to lay out the aims and objectives of Lalbagh, uh, both for the botanic garden and horticulture, as well as they decided that they would get professional bot botanists 
from Q to common man, Lal Bagh. And so you had from 1858, when William New came in, right up to Marie Goddard's tenure in 1873, uh, 19, sorry, 1973, uh, over a century, six gardeners would be trained in Q, which included Mr. Javareya as well as Marie Gauda. There were three Englishmen, and uh, there was, of course, Mr. Krumbagel. Now, William New came in in 18... Okay, we'll move on to uh, Black. Now, we William New came in newly. He was very excited with what he saw in 1858. He landscaped Lal Bagh. He built that band, planted trees on the slope of the band, which he created specially to plant trees there. He, within two years, in 1861, he listed out all the plants in Lal Bagh, which was 1,100 and something, which was sent to, to uh, Edinburgh. Uh, at that time, the focus was still, uh, because of Clegorn, uh, in uh, in Scotland. Later, it moved to uh, Kew Gardens, and he he did numerous things with Lalbagh, but the, he pioneered them. And the listing of the plants are very important because within two years, he had already cultivated these plants, which are great successes uh, in in Lalbagh. Then he did a lot of other things for irrigation, so on and so forth, uh, within Lal Bagh. And now I'm, I'm going to talk less about uh, the people who come in who helm Lal Bagh because they're quite well known. Adam uh, Black came in from at the recommendation of Sir William Hooker to Lal Bagh. He was in ill health, and they thought coming to Lal Bagh, his health would improve. He was a curious man. Lalbagh at that time ended very close to the glass house. And the, the rock in Lalbagh was outside Lalbagh at that time. So he saw the rock there and he saw how it was terraced. And he noticed how the natives, as he puts it, uniquely quarried the rock. When they wanted a circular slab of rock, they marked it out. Put a, you know, created a channel around the circle, which was about four feet deep, four inches deep and about four, five inches wide. They hammered in, uh, uh, metal pegs at the bottom, iron pegs, and put in logs, wooden logs and eucalyptus leaves on top and set the top on fire. And after some time, the top expanded, the bottom cracked exactly where the pegs were driven in, and they, you know, lifted the the rock piece, actually prized it out first with crowbars, and then they lifted and took it away. Now, there are two, three things which uh, Black was impressed with and which we should be impressed with today. We don't even notice it in Lalbagh. The first was that everything was done noiselessly. They never took out more rock than they required, and they did it silently, and... Later, if they needed more rock, they took out another circular piece, you know. And as Baijus will tell you, a circle contains the greatest square area <laughs> within any of the figures. So he was so impressed, he sent a sketch in a letter to Sovele Mokka in Kew Gardens, showing exactly how the rock was actually, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the terracing was created by all the circular slabs being removed. He shows on top, parent rock he's written. On the left, also parent rock. In between, he shows, uh, I can't quite read it, but fire, yes, he's put in there, fire. And at the bottom again, parent rock, and then he shows the thickness of the rock and the wedges very clearly there in dark black. He, he was so impressed. Of course, much later, this land was acquired. But if you ever go to Lalbagh, you'll see this lovely terracing. It was done because of the quarrying, and it's all circular slabs. Now, of course, it looks lovely, but when they discovered the antiquity of the rock, they stopped the quarrying, you know. But what is to be emphasized is 150, 70 years ago, when this quarrying was done, the people who lived around Lalbagh and, I suppose, everywhere else, had great regard for nature. 
and they didn't do what they we do today i mean we get a you know kirloskar pneumatic drill drill a hole get a you know dynamite stick put it in and blow up the hole inside and take pieces of granite out as you can see all the way to the airport on the left they had so much reverence that they didn't uh, you know take out more than what they needed and they did it noiselessly and silently next okay the lal bag uh, the glass house is actually based on the crystal palace which was based on a plant structure which was the uh, you know victoria regia later called victoria amazonica and this shows you a photograph of how a victoria regia can take the weight of a standing person on it without anything happening to the lily pad which is turned up at the end so when the competition for the building which would house this was done the head gardener of the duke of devonshire paxton put in his uh, uh, you know design two weeks after the uh, last date and he designed it on the victoria regia which he found has uh, is capable of taking a great deal of weight and that is because the underside has radial ribs and cross ribs like in a spider's web but all of it has entrained air in it so it is buoyant of its own accord and i've seen there there you can see it uh, all the ribs and pockets of air and he found that a great deal of weight can be ca carried down through a narrow slender slender stem of the victoria regia to the ground so he replicated this in his design of the crystal palace all that great weight of glass comes down to the ground through narrow slender columns and this is a copy of it you can see the slender columns coming down to the ground glass is a naturally very very heavy substance and this is a replica the only one remaining now because the original crystal palace burnt up in two major fires in sydney mill where it was taken to later next yes this is now just uh, i'm talking about the structures within lalbagh that was the original kempegowda tower on the left and on the right you've got the same tower which has been worked on the pillars are the same and it has been converted into something like a hindu mandapa but it's not true to history that is a painting i think of uh, i'm not quite sure maybe uh, martin or any of the four or five painters who made paintings from the rock uh, of of the gardens below which are just next to the rock but it shows you the change but uh, that is embedded the original structure is embedded in the new uh, tower which was changed in kempegowda's i mean in kengalanamanthaya's time then this of course the famous kumbhagal hall it was built actually constructed in 1860s and this is where kumbhagal used to spend most of his time it's a small hall uh, exquisite architecture it also held a herbarium which had disappeared but it was done in that hall it was a lecture hall for young horticulturists next botanical illustrations i'll stop at the botanical illustrations uh, yes in uh, erstwhile mysore state you had three centers for botanical illustrations the biggest was lalbagh itself and then in shimoga and then the basil mission in uh, mangalore now right you can get to the next just to give you a little background the, these are two woodcuts from da, uh, da costa's work who was a portuguese who lived in goa and he wrote the first account of materia medica in india and uh, it, they are woodcuts actually but you can identify the plant you have pepper on the right and you have jackfruit on the left next then you have this marvelous work 12 volumes magisterial brought out by van reed who was the governor of cochin uh, and this is in 12 volumes superbly written you know illustrated probably the finest illustrations botanically anywhere in the world at any time these two are insets from volume 3 of 
uh, what is called hortus malabaricum and the uh, you know the botanical illustrations are as i said in an inset and the names of the dutch artists who made them were uh, bastian stopendale and another dutch artist called gotkind anthony gotkin because they've signed it each and every one of the illustrations of the plants there is from the western ghats about 792 of them and each one superbly illustrated and each one has the name of the plant in arabic and sanskrit in latin and sometimes in dutch and uh, and of course in malayalam as you can see on the top left of the right painting next well this basil mission they used another technique of nature self print and there was uh, reverend onziga and father metz who around the basil mission they collected plants and they you know actually put ink and put any form of pressure on the ink and on the lithograph or even paper they got these images the thing about these nature self print is dimensionally they are correct and there is a softness and uh, uh of you know uh, almost velvety finish to each one of the illustrations and the venation of the plants comes out very very clearly and this was the first exposure in europe to all the plants around mangalo next then the, of course clegon's painting there what i have done here to save time is to compare chelavaya raju's paintings which tragically i noticed this year there's been a book brought out from q gardens the author is martin rix and it's uh, you know uh, martin rix is the editor of uh, curtis magazine which is part of q now and in england you have over 28000 botanical illustrations from india and they've talked about every other artist in india except chelavaya raju was in lalbag for 10 years and they have a lot of his paintings which have gone from bangalore in cameron's reports annual reports to kugu gardens this is the extent they have neglected the world has neglected the work done out of bangalore and so are we even we are not aware of this now there was a complaint in kugu gardens that indian painters are very stiff you know in in their paintings all their paintings are very stiff and uh, you know it's not flexible so nolte in a special lecture on robert white in the lenel society actually projected this it's a painting by rangaya it is of a kurkubit he says look at the painting rangaya started with the stem on the right hand corner bottom corner and he's taken the stem for a walk if not a dance i mean it puts it very well i mean this this was a prejudice against indian painters because it's not so i mean look at the flexibility the ebullience the sinuousness of the whole painting you know right now i'm taking the a painting of chelavaya raju comparing it with other painters of the both having made painted the same plant here on we have what is called here painting on the left is by chelavaya raju the one on the right of by govindu which q gardens and everybody else knows very well now this is of a plant called castronospermum austral it was found where the brisbane rivers empty out empties out into the sea uh, and what's called morton bay it, in fact it's called the morton bay uh, bean plant also and look at the difference between the paintings of the same plant by two different artists govindu on the right and chelavaya raju from lalbag on the left these plants were very soon planted and you have a avenue of it from maharaja statue to sidalangaya uh, you know uh, circle today uh, the whole way through unfortunately it's been beautifully covered with diesel dust so we can't see the flowers in pristine beauty like these but look at how beautiful the flowers are and how beautifully these paintings have been executed next now on the right is a painting of a mango by chelavaya raju look at the different way these 
uh, botanical illustrations are painted. They're all botanically and scientifically accurate. Dimensions, proportions, the colors, all of it. Uh, the, the one on the right is done by Chalavaya Raju so beautifully that he's cut the mango and you can almost feel the juices flowing out of it. On the left is a thing which you constantly see with mango trees, they're beautiful magenta colored new leaves, so beautifully portrayed here. Next, yes, this is, this is called Kigelia pinata. You have a stand of them in Lalbag. You have it in different places in Bangalore. It comes from Africa. Uh, the one on the left is by Govindu. The one on the right is by Chalavaya Raju. Look how it's superbly done, but differently. Now it's also called the sausage plant and Chalavaya Raju has painted the sausage. Uh, you know, it goes like that uh, at the right bottom. They all, Chalavaya Raju here, I think what he's portrayed is certainly superior to Govindu's paintings, which are very well known in Europe and America today. Next is this is the painting of our simple Karela or Mormodica. Sharanta, as it's called in Latin. The left one is by Govindu, the right one is by Chalavaya Raju. I wouldn't dare attempt an, to paint this. Look at how the texture of the bitter gourd comes out. In, you know, so beautifully down. Even the pencil, pen sketch on the left bottom and uh, left top by Chalavaya Raju. Superbly done, sinuous. The flowers are there, the leaves are very clear, and the texture of the bitter gold. Next, yes, the, the one on the left is called Calotropis. Uh, this is, uh, it's commonly called the milkweed. You find it all over the countryside in India. This was painted by Govindu. These were the last two, uh, no, by the Maratha artist uh, of Clegon. These were the last two paintings done by him, I think, for Clegon. The left painting shows the flowers and the leaves. These flowers are so beautiful. They are used as garlands uh, for Lord Ganesha in Benares in all the temples. Garlands are made out of this. And Queen Lilio Kalani of Hawaii, she made jewelry uh, replicating these flowers, you know, and enamel work, very beautifully done. And on the right, you have the famous Indian Datura, which is deadly poisonous. It's a beautiful plant and I've got five daturas painted and shown in different ways so that you can see what you can do with botanical illustrations. This is nature self imprint by Clegon himself of the datura. It's also called Brugmansia. It's got a, got a number of names. And uh, look at the velvety finish, a rich softness uh, using this technique. Look at the venation of the leaves comes out very clearly. The left is, I think, by Marianne North, uh, who's a famous painter. It's an oil, uh, you know, painting. And the, this is of what was called uh, Brugmansia. It was found in Chile. Batram, a uh, art collector, uh, rather plant collector, bought it and brought it to America, sent it to Kew Gardens. Now it's come to India. And you have this growing beautifully in Lalbag and in the third block park in uh, Koromangla. And you've got the same Brugmansia, which is, or Datura, which has been Datura Stramonium, which is shown in uh, Hortus Malabaricum. It's a copper plate, hand painted later. So, so you've seen four different ways of handling Datura. Uh, whatever name you give it, Brugmansia, otherwise, all done differently, copper plates, hand painted, oil paints, nature self print, you know, and what Chalavaya Raju has done. This one is my favorite painting out of Clegon's collection. It's of the wild ginger. It was made when they saw this plant, they did, science did not know of this plant, but it was painted anyway by the Maratha artist. It was painted at a place called uh, Huliel, uh, very close to Darwad. They didn't know the plant, but he painted it nonetheless, and it's part of the Clegon collection in Edinburgh. Then in 1993, three taxonomists, uh, Velayadin, Amal Raj, and a third one, Murli Daran, 
found this 50 miles away in a tea garden where it's growing endemically and it was established that this is the wild ginger and they gave it a name, a scientific name. For the first time it's called Kurkuma Karnataka Kensis today. This is again, now I'm only talking about Chalavaya Raju, three, four of his illustrations. This is a beautiful one of the Chakota or the Shadok. Look at the painting, the restricted frame. You've got, you, you can see even the pores on the uh, uh, Chakota. Then you have the citrus leaves and the beautiful flowers. Next. This is a painting of what is called Ficus Krishna, a fascinating plant. Uh, this has been done by Chalavaya Raju and very, very accurately. Next. Yes, there was a time that a red and russet dye was produced from a plant called Opuntia on which uh, uh, the cochineal insect fed and the exudations from the cochineal insect led to a carmine dye. These were imported, these plants were imported, it's now called the, commonly called the prickly pear. They were imported from Mexico and first grown in Madras and then came to Lalbagh and Chalavaya Raju painted this. The flowers, the thorns, uh, the buds, all of it. Very beautifully painted. And this is what the, the, the days before the big German companies had synthetic paints. This was the paint which was, which came, come and die, which came from this plant, which was used for red and russet colors for woolens, as well as cotton, indigo, and others. Cameron, Cameron. Now, one thing I want to mention here, and people don't understand this or ne never take it into account. Cameron spent something like 32 years in Lalbag. Krumbagel spent 24 plus 24 years, 48 years in Bangalore. 24 as head of the government garden section. Then he was director of uh, agriculture. So these people had a lot of time then, of course, Marigauda spent 22 years. Javareya spent the least amount, and therefore all his potential couldn't be realized because he was there in charge. I mean, uh, so were the others, but Javareya headed Lalbagh and the government garden section and from something like 1922, 32 to 1944, out of which five years was taken out on deputation to Delhi where he started the flower shows and agricultural marketing. So he totally spent only about seven years in Lalbagh. So one couldn't expect too much impact from the work he had done because what potential there was was tremendous considering how he trained himself and what he had done in Delhi. Uh, he did a number of things and he was quite an extraordinary man, very polished, straddled the Eastern and Western world. And it is a pity that he died young when he was, uh, you know, the advisor to the Nawab of Bhopal on horticulture. So, but apart from that, Cameron spent, as I said, 32 years, 1874 to 1908. Krumbeigel from 1908 to 1932, plus another 24 years till he died in Bangalore. So the quantum of work done by these three uh, spread over a large period of time. They were all productive, but they didn't have the fire, the, you know, pioneering spirit of the others uh, who helmed Lalbagh for the first 50 years. And largely because they were told what to do and they followed it. They were all productive in their own way, you know. Next. Yeah, well, uh, you know, Cameron was famous for, he did a number of things. He did the greatest amount of work on coffee. He went to Kadur. He talked with all the planters. He developed four or five different strains of coffee, Nalaknad coffee, then Arabica, Robusta, uh, you know, all of them, and, you know, hybrids. He did a lot of work in different fields on rubber, on cotton, so on and so forth. Trumbagel similarly was a very versatile man. Uh, he was trained for landscape, uh, you know, design, plus various other things to do with plants. But above all, uh, he spread out, made buildings, 
Yeah, he was called a bioesthete, which was a special name given uh, to just a few people in India who uh, actually beautified the surroundings of a area very, very effectively through their planting. This is Indian Institute of Science, which is scrubland, which is time. Anyway, Krumbagel set up a whole lot of gardens, some with Dr. Nerodi, right up to Jubilee Park and Jamshedpo. This is Krishna Raja Saga designed by Krumbagel. Next, this was the BBMP building, the original blueprint. It doesn't have the square towers on it. Next, they lie a little museum building made by Krumbagel within Lalbagh itself. And behind that is his favorite tree flowering, that is Spatodia Campanulata. Next, the Mr. Javaraya, as I've already mentioned, the different things he did. Javaraya, uh, when, when, when he was in charge of Lalbagh, you had this beautiful interior with the fountain there, which is all gone now, and that lovely trellis work, which let in enough light, but didn't make the whole, and the whole area inside was very cool. This is the glass house, right? Yes, this was a big thing, which took out five years out of Lalbagh for Mr. Javaraya. He was, he was transferred to Delhi, where he started the flower shows, based on the flower shows in Lalbagh. And it was so successful that it was the Delhi flower shows have been compared to the Chelsea flower shows. And he, this, this is a photograph from a newspaper of the first flower show in Delhi in March, uh, what's it, 1934, where the Vice Reign of India, Lady Linlithgow, is actually, she inaugurated it, and Mr. Javaraya is to her right, uh, you know, showing her around. Next. Now, I think the greatest achievement of Javaraya was when he, when he was transferred to Delhi. This is hardly talked about, people don't know about it. He was asked to head the, what is called the Agricultural Marketing Division of uh, the Imperial Council of Agricultural Research. Now, uh, they, this was a stupendous undertaking. All the fruits and uh, vegetables and agricultural produce were to be identified across the face of India, from Burma to Baluchistan, from Kanyakumari up to Kashmir. And then they were to be marketed across India first. And Javaraya spent some years involved in that, and he headed that. And this, this is a beautiful photograph because it shows you Javaraya in many moods, immaculately dressed as he always is, sitting on the ground, checking apples, uh, you know, with, in, in Kashmir before they are packed and dispatched. Now, if today we get Kashmiri and Himachal Pradesh apples in Bangalore within two days of their dispatch, it is because of what Javaraya started, you know, identifying what is produced where and how to transport it across the country. Of course, he spent very little time there. Uh, to see it all grow up. But I can mention this very clearly and categorically about Mr. Javaraya. He spent very little time in Lal Bagh, but he was still a very great institution builder. He started the Indian Institute of, uh, you know, for fruit uh, at Hisaragata, Mandya Orchards, a whole lot of uh, institutions, but he didn't live to see them all thrive as today. Next, Mare Gauda. Mare Gauda took everything which was done for a hundred years out of Lalbagh to the rest of Karnataka, you know. And he was the last of the Kew gardeners. He spent over a year in Kew. This is how he approached it. Uh, Mare Gauda introduced a lot of things for farming, dry land farming, seed culture, seed protection, soil testing equipment, a tremendous number of things. The nice photograph of Mare Gauda with uh, Dharma Veera was the governor of Karnataka, almost on their knees, uh, looking over grapes in a vineyard. This is my book cover. That is a photograph of, of the statue of uh, Chamarajendra Wadayar, the tenth, made by a sculptor. It was a bronze sculpture made by 
Onslow Ford, who made it was in Curzon Park in Mysore. Krumbagel brought it to Lalbag and put it there. It is, I think, symbolic of the trans, the movement of power and the center of power from Mysore to Bangalore. And uh, Ford made only one other sculpture in India, that is of the Raja of Darbanga in Dalhousie Square in Calcutta. Uh, much for that uh, broad, expansive, sweeping history of Lal Bagh, uh, from the uh, geological uh, treasures, its natural history, botanical illustrations, um, all the way to the 20th century and the colorful personalities that contributed to what it is today. Um, I'd like to invite Arun Pai on stage at this point to moderate the discussion and to take a few audience questions if there's time. There was pin drop silence for one hour, 20 minutes. He didn't have a sip of water. How many of you have been on a walk with Vijay in Lalbagh? Could you please raise your hands? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. I've been working with him for 15 years and I hate to tell him to stop talking. And today I had that un terrible job of giving him a hint that you have to stop in 40 minutes and then you spoke Vijay for one hour, 20. <laughs> I'm sorry. So we, we, allowed, we allowed you twice your time. And, and so, uh, since so many of you, like me, have shared and enjoyed every word he said, uh, I was given the task of actually asking some more questions, <laughs> okay, to dig deeper into something else. Um, so, I'll probably just say two things. Almost everything you said today is in this book. So, you know, if you felt it was an encyclopedia of information that it was overwhelming, it was. It's all there written nicely. Vijay has this habit of speaking like, an, like a talking encyclopedia. He speaks like he writes. Um, I think almost everything you said have read in the book. So I think that's one thing that um, if you found a lot of great information, it's all here. It's in one place. That's something very nice. But what I will try and do is I will read a couple of passages from the book that interested me and uh, ask him something deeper. Uh, not controversial, but uh, you know something which is the answer not in the book. So I'll st um, since we are short of time, I've just picked a few uh, passages. But what interested me a lot was the little line on Kempe Gauda. This flower garden, Hovinna Tota, was laid out in 1537 with a view to growing flowers for worshipping in temples. Now, this was the first time I had an, ever seen in writing that actually traced the antiquity of Lalbagh beyond 1760s, like, as most of us know, to almost 500 years ago with Kempe Gauda. It's not the common narrative, it's not something I'd heard about. So my question to you is, it's quite a, it's quite a big deal. It is, of course. I mean, so, so how is it that the establishment of a garden at this location by Kempe Gauda was, is generally ignored in the narrative and has now come to light? I'm just curious to know what it tells us about us as people, how little we know about our own places, and your take on that? Well, most of the history uh, of Bangalore has been written by the colonial rulers to start with. And you could not have expected colonial rulers to talk about Kempe Gauda and what he had done at that time. So it's not recorded. And we Indians anyway do not record things. So this is something which is carried on and we've put bits and pieces together mm -hmm. and make up a history which is disjointed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that uh, that's the main problem. And that is why you've not heard of it, neither had I, till I read a publication of the uh, Horticulture Society, where this is clearly established. But this changes the whole perspective, and it makes sense. I mean, here is Kempe Gauda, who had been blessed by Guru Nanak to start his new city, in uh, what, we, what we know of as Bangalore today. He builds a tower on the southern end to show the limits to which he expects Bangalore to grow. Mm -hmm. It would only be natural that he would use that land, there was a, a you know, water body there, to grow flowers for the temples. Temples are important things, a very major institution in those days. You know, And his son, we know this also on record, that is Magdei Kempagoda, continued growing flowers there, till 1559. We're talking from 1537 to 1559 now. There's a little gap there because nobody has recorded what's happened. Till Haider comes and he finds a flower garden, but more than that, 
a Mavena Tope, a dry, you know, mango orchard mm -hmm. on which he built all of Lalbagh. But the same figures occur for a few centuries, 34 acres, mm -hmm. 35 acres, maybe 37 acres, right up to uh, Alan Black, who talks about the garden having expanded to 50 acres, yes. and then Cameron to 120 acres, and to Marigoda to two, 200 acres of land, and a pertinent lake of 35 acres. And that's the only bit of green in Bangalore which has expanded. And I think largely because every one of those people who helmed Lalbagh, the moment they acquired contiguous land, they broke the wall and rebuilt the wall so that that wall is something which people would not encroach on. And it worked very, very well. I mean, it started at 34 acres, and now we've got totally with the lake 240 acres, you know. Thank you. One hopes uh, we find out more about this. So, moving next to Tipu Sultan, who is, uh, you know, widely credited with doing a lot of work out there. I'm reading again from your book. Tipu's experiments in botany and horticulture have had a lasting impact in, in as much as establishing Mysore as a pioneer in horticulture, sericulture and agro industries. Now, Tipu Sultan was a fighting man. Yes. He, he, he had to fight to survive, he had to fight to expand. It was an era where nobody rested, they were not, you know, emperors of leisure. Yes. Uh, he died young, 49. Yes, true. How and why did he find the time <laughs> to invest uh, in, in all these fields? And I remember you telling me how he brought 22 chests of seeds across the Western Ghats. Huge investment and effort. Yes. So my question is, today we struggle to find the time and the effort yes. to, to do things that are not core to what we think are important. And clearly, the, so I'm just, I'm just curious to know, why do you think Tipu Sultan invested so much time doing what he did? Two things. One, as a Muslim, a garden on earth was a reflection of paradise. This is important to understand the psyche and the thinking of Muslim rulers. The second is, although they were savagely fighting wars, and in those days, you either acquired territory or you lost territory. So we had to keep on fighting. And there was no UN to appeal to. Not that the UN is doing a great job either. But nonetheless, they had to be alert and they had to keep on fighting, acquiring territory. Yet, they were able to change gears very fast mentally. And after a savage war, they would set up, if they had an inclination, beautiful gardens sometimes Charbag and other gardens, like the Malavalli garden, Buchanan notes right as Tipu died, that there were 2,400 mango and orange trees. You know, that was one of the things started by Haida. But uh, they were extraordinary people, and Tipu particularly, his love for plants, uh, how plants permeated his thinking and his father's, and how he put it into practical application. Like even in the dispensation of justice for a minor crime, uh, the criminal would be let off if he planted two trees and saw them grow to a certain height. If it was a major crime, he had to grow fruiting trees till they bore fruit and then he was let off. Garlands were, you know, jasmine garlands were placed around the necks of esteemed guests uh, right through from Hyder's days. Uh, everywhere plants seem to you know, sort of be a major thing, dominating their thinking. Then, of course, he started uh, the sericulture industry. Then, of course, Chakota, which I've just talked about. But he was a driven man. Mm -hmm. I mean, he went to Turkey, collected figs. Well, Turkey is the home of figs worldwide. That's where it comes from originally. And then that culminated ultimately in Javareya setting up what is called uh, the fig garden at Ganjam, which is on the outskirts of Sri Rangapatna. You know, everything Tipu did seemed to work out very, very well. That, uh, that was one thing I had not mentioned earlier. Then, of course, I mentioned sericulture, poppies, opium. He was the person who started. Uh, the, he declared pepper uh, and tobacco and sandalwood as plants on which only, it, uh, you know, the... Uh, could be dealt with commercially by royalty. Mm -hmm. That continues till today as far as sandalwood goes. It has not changed. The state owns the sandalwood plant even if it's growing accidentally in your property, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Um, when I talk about Bangalore, I often we are often asked why is Bangalore the IT capital, the knowledge hub, and most of the answers go back to the setting up of the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore by the Tatas who. should ideally have set it up in mumbai so for a variety of reasons it was set up here it's just 100 years old and you can trace back a lot of bangalore's today to an institution built 100 years ago True. lal bag is an institution is what i get from from what an institution based in bangalore where some of the world's leading figures in their fields operated from modern botany came to india through lal bag yes so my question is where all these people you mentioned cleghorn and munro they were all spectacular figures yes. who contributed or brought their knowledge into lal bag I'm interested in the reverse. If an institution that is now 250 years old or maybe 200, <clears throat> what contribution has Bangalore and Lal Bagh made to the world of taxonomy and botany by being where it is, and why have we not continued that practice? Well, in a sense, I answered. Uh, I mean, this is all bits and pieces, but I mean, uh, the identification of the uh, wild ginger was done by Indian taxonomists. You know, three of them. which are, it was unknown to science that plant right from when it was painted till 133 years afterwards so they you you find bits and pieces like this everywhere because we didn't record things at all mm -hmm. uh, like for example the, the american uh, you know agricultural department wanted four fig trees from india Krumbagal sent out four fig trees, which included the goni mara, which grows everywhere around Bangalore and very well in Mysore state. In fact, Benjamin Hain named it Ficus mysorensis, and in books of botany you'll find Hain in brackets. Now, extraordinary thing is, this also shows you the way we think and the way the Western world thinks. The in a place called, uh, well, it's uh, Paloma College. next to san diego in america they produce excellent wine from the figs of the goni mara we have never thought of it in india and if any of you go to san diego go and buy a few bottles of that wine take pity on me and bring back one for me <laughs> so, so but but they, they, you know they they produce wine and jellies from the fig of the goni mara and karnataka today has goni maras everywhere everywhere you know you got a massive one in lal bag which has got a spread of 180 feet we would you know when we talk about goni mara that's the way we think we would rather go back i think to kalidasa's poem see if it's mentioned there incorporate that bit into our body of knowledge but to investigate it find out its uses applications so on so forth we don't do and lots of the things which have happened have not been recorded at all italian uh, cheese makers they use a lot of figs uh, of different kinds which are not edible in the sense they're not tasty but they use it to flavor cheeses we have use of only two figs one is the anjir or the you know ficus caraica and the others in north india they use the gular or cluster fig they they you know they make curries out of it or even eat it raw as it were but a lot of lot has gone out mm -hmm. uh, lot lots and lots and uh, we are not aware of it i come across things all over the place there's this gentleman called fairchild he's alexander graham bell's grandson in law you know and he has he was called the plant collector and he went all over the world for about 40 years collecting plants There's this lovely story of how he brought the mango for planting in Florida. He collected a whole lot of mangoes in Bombay and baskets of it. And you've got to go by boat to the ship. And the ship captain said, "Sorry, we can't take it. There's too much weight." Look at the enterprise of the man. He took these mangoes, went to the near the Taj, uh, and asked all the urchins to come. and had them eat it all up and give him give him the, the <laughs> seed <laughs> and then the weights were correct then he could have added on more seeds <coughs> and then they, they, that that uh, that is how mangoes were introduced into florida you know uh, it's this, a fascinating so this story is not in the book huh? that is not in the book <laughs> yeah so there's a lot which is not yet in the book you need a second edition to yeah. do with bombay and fair child i'm not <laughs> put it in you know yeah so i'm going But, to move on to the next uh, yes, question yes. just to go to a new topic yes um i'm reading from the book again Sir William Hooker, 
director of Kew Gardens, considered that the introduction of Sincona plants into India would be remembered as the most important contribution of Kew Gardens to India. Yes. Do you agree? And tell us a little more yes, about Sincona I do agree. because you haven't. I do agree. <laughs> I mean, in, in the 1860s, malaria was the biggest killer in the world. It probably is even today, apart from what the pandemic is doing, you know. Now, the, we, we, the discovery of the source of malaria, as well as the antidote to malaria, separated by 20 years. Now, the, the, you know, the antidote to malaria was quinine, which came from the Chinchona plant. So the British sent out, uh, you know, Mr. Markham, who was a botanist, to Peru to collect Chinchona seeds and saplings and they found in the Andes. So he brought it to India. It was first planted in Lalbagh and, uh, you know, nurtured there. It came to Telicherry first, all these plants, then to Lalbagh. Uh, Clegon got involved and he knew the places where in Uti this should be planted. Now the plan was, and brilliantly worked out, that because 10% of the workforce, Indian, Workforce is always down at malaria. Plan was to make chinchona bark available to every single Indian through the greatest distribution system the world has known and still knows. That is the Indian post office. You know, you have one even in snowbound Laul and Spiti at 14,500 feet. So the chinchona bark was supplied to all post offices in India and was sold to Indians at cost. You just had to take the bark home, boil it and drink this bitter, you know, quinine containing uh, extract, which you got from it, tea which had quinine in it. Uh, it is a horrible thing, the taste. But the British being our rulers had to imbibe their quinine in a superior fashion. So you had gin and tonic water, if you please. Tonic water, by definition, contains quinine, you know. So then, and you, you can imagine the impact, the way it was worked out. I haven't told the whole story, but it was Ronald Ross, who in 1880s and 1890s, he, he, he was appointed assistant sanitary garrison engineer in Bangalore to look after the containment area medically, so, so to say, uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, no diseases spread. So he cleaned out the wells and what have you. But he had a lot of time in his hands. He'd play tennis in Coburn Park every afternoon, have all three meals in the officer's mess in the MEG center. He noticed in the MEG center that after having his meals often, the bearers would throw their empty trays on the lawn outside. That would collect rainwater and in turn larvae. And those larvae became mosquitoes. So Ronald Ross was the first person to suspect and to prove that those were the female Anopheles mosquito who carried the malaria vector. To prove it, he did an extra really funny thing. He, he got hold of his assistant called Hussein Ali. He put him into a mosquito net, introduced the female Anopheles mosquito, paid Hussein Ali two annas per bite of the female Anopheles mosquito. Hussein Ali was, in his bizarre way of thinking, very happy with it because he got a malaria immediately, but he thought that at least he got paid for it. The rest of the population of Bangalore didn't. You know, it's, it's an extraordinary thing when you read the history of this. Then Ronald Ross wrote up his papers and then he was transferred to Sikandrabad Cantonment and he sent his papers to Europe. He was the second person in the world to get, uh, you know, the Nobel Prize for Medicine or Physiology in 1902 for work done in India and in Bangalore, started in Bangalore. And I thought it would be appropriate for the Prime Minister to go to the Nobel Committee and claim that for India, because Ronald Ross was born in Almoda in India, he did his work in India, and the mosquitoes were Indian. <laughs> but then Arun corrected me, he said, you know, he went, he went and found out the original document, it said, Ronald Ross of India. So yeah, I started Ross, correcting The citation them. says Ronald Ross India, so technically yeah. he was yeah. from India. Yeah. It was fascinating as in the pandemic time that 100 years ago, Yeah. 
both the pandemic its cure the human yeah. trials yeah. and the solution were found between bowering hospital also lake true so true. the connections are immense and i'm just going to ask my final question vijay because yeah. there are many more and we're short of time but this yeah. is a question where i want you to to dream it's not in the book right and i wanted to understand what is your vision for lalbagh your dream or to put it more differently if in the audience and we may have them you have the government you have philanthropists you have someone who can do something what is your wish list for what this institution should become i would start with lalbagh's strengths as a botanic garden and uh, they are not mutually exclusive a park and a botanic garden like hyde park was started as a botanic garden i mean not hyde park kew gardens only in 1760 1759 by uh, the earl of bute and princess augusta you know introduce exotic plants till then it was a royal retreat just like lalbagh you know very similar and the dates are also quite similar 1760 was an either valley started this with that there are so many things which i would build upon uh captain prabhala is a great advocate of Uh, he insists that this knowledge must be disseminated must must be across fertilization every two weeks there must be a lecture on botany and the plant science its sciences out of lalbagh uh, then there must be a interaction between the botanists of kew gardens and other gardens worldwide with the botanists of uh, lalbagh then i insist and i think that's the right way to go about it because in the papers i'm constantly reading about new species of plants and frogs and what have you being found in the western ghats lalbagh should generate plant collecting expeditions into the western ghats 239 species of orchids are in the western ghats out of which 139 are endemic to what is karnataka part of western ghats you can't separate them so there should be a huge uh, you know uh, orchidarium because it's at the same heights that the orchids grow in the western ghats and india is one of the great places for orchids you know and we should have an orchidarium in lalbagh and last year in fact they did have an exhibition of orchids during the republic day uh, function and the the plant collecting expedition there should be a museum there should be a museum of the different woods of the different trees in south india and things like that in the exhibitions which so that the general public must be educated and they must be in how to put it i don't have the correct but they must be encouraged to look at the environment study the trees understand what our environment consists of you know is that the yeah i mean last uh, You know, Let's I mean, hope it happens. No, there, there's so many other yeah. things I can add on, but just with this as a start, I think you could uh, Lalbagh would be a wonderful place. It must become an international center ultimately for you know botanical sciences. Mm-hmm. Today there is a lot of work, research work being done in botany, in A3, GK, VK, you know, NCBS, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But the you know what you have in Lalbagh is something unique. you know it's a park it's a botanic garden yeah, what we need to do is what i saw of course the, uh, the little patronizing what i saw in botanic garden uh, somewhere in the west there was a herbarium of this botanic garden which is just half the size of lalbag the herbarium has 1.6 million different species of plants and i saw a little girl run into the herbarium with a plant in her hands just the roots sticking out no soil and the young men there were preparing these charts and pinning down the plants uh they came around to her and asked her what was she doing there with that plant so she said you know how my mother is she's completely useless i found this plant in her house she said go to the botanic garden they'll tell you what it is so i'm here <laughs> so the they couldn't identify the plant then she picked up courage to say call the boss man down he might know so he came down he had a look at it also he said i don't know this plant but you've got to do me three favors young lady so then she quieted up she didn't know what what was going on he said i will put up this plant on our website and it'll go all around the world 
and there'll be a number of botanists who'll be able to identify it. I'll, I'll take out photographs of the roots and stem and leaves and everything. Then the second favor you've got to do for me is let me put this plant in a pot, which I'll return to you. And the third favor was after they've identified the plant, they were going to have a public lecture on the plant. And who is going to be the chief guest invited by the director of the herbarium, this young girl. And then he tells her charmingly, it's your choice if you want to invite your mother or not. <laughs> you know, but look at this. There's this young girl, completely lost. Her mother is not helping her. And suddenly she, she would, you know, just as little incident will make sure she's interested in botany all her life even if she don't make it a profession. We need this kind of thing because we've got such incredible wealth, not only in Lalbagh, but everywhere around. I'll end with that. So I think on that note, uh, we are behind time, but I think we can ask. Thank you. Continue the conversation informally. Yeah, so I think unfortunately the audience will not get time to ask questions, but I think Vijay will be able to yeah, uh, on stage uh -huh. to talk yeah. uh, after that. So we'd like to thank Vijay Thiruvadi and Arun Pai. As you can see, I think uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we've had the, this wonderful panoramic magisterial view of the history of Lal Bagh, but also all the connections to many distant continents through this luminous botanical world that seems to lift all of our spirits. Before we conclude, there are a few people here whose presence we would like to acknowledge. Uh, Captain Prabhala, who was closely connected to the writing and production of the book. Uh, he was formerly the head of the Bangalore Environment Trust, and he's here. Um, I'd like to mention the grandchildren of Mr. Javraya, Harish Padmanabha, and Sharmila Gowda, who are here. And um, of course, Lily, who, uh, Lily Dechama, Vijay's assistant, who has been operating the slides and who's done incredible work through the whole pandemic and with today's lecture. And I should also mention that on Monday, November 29th, that is at 6.30, day after, we are screening a film on Krumbegel called The Maharaja's German Gardener. And uh, Vijay has also been interviewed for that film. So I, we hope to see you at that event. And thank you all for coming this evening. This is probably one of the largest audiences we have had for a lecture since the pandemic, which is very encouraging to us and a tribute to Vijay's extraordinary work and the many people that he has touched. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, I'm humbled. Uh, I just want to mention here that our chairman, Dr. Yalapa Reddy, is tied up in another function which he was committed to over a month ago at uh, Kidwai Institute of Oncology. So he couldn't make it. Otherwise, we would have had him here also as part of the panel. Right.